<clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm William Wall, and I'm reading to you today as part of uh, an initiative called The Holding Cell, which was set up by my friends Roz and Simon Lewis as a way of bringing lovers of literature together during the pandemic. You can check out The Holding Cell on Facebook. On uh, Its page is The Holding Cell, i.e. Now, before I begin, uh, let me just say that wherever you are in the world, I hope that you and your loved ones are safe and well, and that you stay that way. Today, <clears throat> I'm going to read a short story. I write novels, poetry, and short stories. And the short story comes from this book called Hearing Voices, Seeing Things which was published by Dura Press, D-O-I-R-E, Dura Press, which is based in West Galway, Ireland. <clears throat> the story is called Paper and Ashes. I got the death certs for the crows. I call them the crows. When someone dies, they come pecking. I got five. I came out of the office and it was still daylight, like when you come out of the pictures. I'm there blinking and looking around me and everyone is wearing t-shirts. I'm thinking, there was a reason why people used to wear black, like you're obviously a widow and people show respect. I probably looked like just a 35 year old woman with a handbag full of death certs, except they don't know about the death certs. That's the whole point. So I went down to the river. The sun was shining. My late husband liked water. I thought his ashes standing there. I thought about them. I thought, wouldn't it be nice? Would anybody notice? There was just this old tramp asleep on a bench with a bottle in a brown paper bag. Even if he saw. I looked down over the wall and the tide was out and I could see a shopping trolley in the mud. That gave me a laugh. Then I started to think, wouldn't it be even better if I left the urn in a supermarket trolley? Someone would find it and report it. Would the person who lost the human ashes please come to the information desk? Better again, if I put him on a shelf in the pickles section or in the fridge with the soups. If I could get one of those stickers reduced to clear. I remember my late mother saying once, that man of yours knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Everybody says that about accountants. So that's what I was thinking when someone hit me right between the shoulder blades. I don't remember falling out onto the road, but I remember the sound of a car passing right near me. I remember thinking, that one missed me. Then someone was helping me up. It was the tramp. My death certs, I said. No fear of that, Mrs., the tramp said. No, I said, they were in my handbag. The tramp pointed up the street and I saw the boy who hit me. He was running and throwing things. There were things from my handbag, bits of paper, keys, my mobile went over the wall into the river. Some of the death certs were going up on the wind. I could see one drifting over the wall. I started to run, but my back and shoulders hurt. I had to stop. All of a sudden, I had a bad headache. The, strand, the tramp started to run too, and he got about three feet ahead of me. Now he was leaning on his knees, wheezing. We walked. We did not say anything to each other. I was thinking, why is this tramp walking with me? We're like an old couple. When we reached the place where my bits started, I found my car keys. I saw the certs going upriver. The tide was coming in. They were just floating. Now, how am I going to prove he's dead? The tramp looked at me. It's just paper, isn't it, he said. My late husband, I said. 
I liked saying late. I'm sorry for your trouble, Mrs. The Tramp said. I found myself shaking his hand. I never touched a tramp before. I let go as soon as he let me. My credit cards, I said. My late husband would have thought about the cards first, then the phone. He wouldn't have bothered about the certs. All I had to do was go back into the registry and queue again, and they'd give me out a hundred if I wanted them. It was stupid. Suddenly I thought, I have only this man, this tramp. Even at the funeral, they were all laughing behind my back, those that aren't owed money. I had ashes, I had the ashes in the boot of the car. It was in the car park. I could be back in five minutes. If we tipped him into the river, he'd go upstream with the serps and end up in a bog somewhere. He'd have his papers anyway, or stuck in a bank. He might even drift up some disused sewer and spend the rest of his days hoping nobody would flush. From what the solicitor told me, that's the way he'd lived for the past two years anyway. At that moment, I felt on top of things. It was the end of a stressed out week. Waking up in the morning and find your husband, finding your husband dead in the ensuite is no joke. He had his pyjamas down around his ankles. What's your name? I asked the tramp. Saddam Hussein. I stared at him. My, my mum called me that after my old dad, didn't she? He said, that was before he was famous. Is that true? No, I don't give out names. I got issues, see? Can I call you Saddam? He grinned. His upper false teeth fell down and he closed his mouth quickly. After a bit of chewing, he said, lost them that way before. He moved away from the river wall. I'm going to be gone for a bit, I said. If I come back, will you still be here? That's my bench, he said, pointing. Unless it's raining, I'll be over there under that stairs. I went to the police station first. I told the duty officer about my bag. He wrote it all down. He let me use the station phone to cancel the credit cards. He asked me if I had a witness. I told him about the tramp. He sighed. That's not a witness, he said. Name, Saddam Hussein. It did not go well. I went to the car park. The ashes were under the passenger seat, not in the boot. I remember putting them on the floor. They must have rolled. So what do we say? The tramp looked at me. Then he composed his face in sorrow and joined his hands in prayer. Um, For what we are about to receive, we thank thee, Lord, he said. No, no, that's not right. Hang on. I could see he was thinking because he was chewing. I suspected he was moving his upper false teeth around. After a bit, he coughed and then coughed again and said, man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He flieth as it were a shadow and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life, we be in death. I stared at him. I was crying. Where did that come from? C of E, he said. My old dad was a vicar, wasn't he? Your old dad was a vicar. Why I don't go in houses, see? I got issues. Because your dad was a vicar. Oh, yes. My husband left me penniless, I said. The tramp nodded at me. I like a nice chat, he said. Get things off my chest. It's good, that. But he looked worried. He took a step backwards. He held his hand out low and flat like he was patting a child's head. Idle hands, he said, get on with it. I was still holding the urn. It was surprisingly light. Is that all we come down to? I was thinking this was better than he deserved. My late husband, accountant, investor extraordinaire, hopeless case.
Maybe it was better than I deserved myself. I remembered a time when we were courting down here at the river. We had a cardboard box of Colonel Saunders Kentucky Fried Chicken. I could identify the actual spot a few hundred yards along the quay. A crow and a seagull were arguing over something. We ate the chicken facing each other, sitting on the wall like people sitting on horses. I met him at a disco. I confess I was happy to have hooked a fast talker, a man with ambition. I remember he explained the stock market to me. Greasy kisses too. Chuck it in, missus, the tramp said. Get on with it. He pointed at the urn. He was agitated. I could see that. He didn't like me changing my mind. Um, I don't want to. Now he was shifting from foot to foot as if he was running on the spot, but he wasn't lifting his feet. He was looking around him. There was a thread of spit on his chin. Then he said, discipline, discipline, discipline. That's what makes a man self-discipline. We had a nice house. We had a disused tennis court. Your dad, we had a flush WC, didn't we? He used to come in my room very, very late, very late and examine the sheets. Forgive, O Lord, for thy dear son, the ill that I this day have done. What if I fell asleep? Where was my mum, you ask? He walked away. I watched him going along the street. He was still talking. He was waving his hands. I could see he was arguing. He didn't sit on his bench. He turned a corner. I felt I had let him down. The sun was sinking behind buildings. I opened the urn. It was a screw cap. I tipped the ashes out and the wind took them. The ashes were a pale yellow color. There was a man on the other bank watching me. He blessed himself. The ashes blew out along the river and the tide carried them upstream. They were headed for the country, paper and ashes, like someone had thrown a fire away. Thank you very much for listening to me. Stay safe. Stay well. See you again sometime. Bye-bye.